we go ahead and uh, get started here. So we've got uh, 10 cases. I think I sent these to you guys ahead of time. So uh, anybody want to give this one a go? Sure, I can, Dr. Cockrell. I'm Christina, one of the first year residents at Baylor. Right. Um, so yeah, good morning. Um, so it looks like here we have multiple sections from what appears to be a shave biopsy. Um, in terms of anatomic site, there is a little bit of kind of extra keratin on the left there. So I was thinking maybe we're kind of getting close to an acral site or kind of transitioning to an acral site possibly. Good, um, yeah, exactly. Okay, I didn't see a lot of hair follicles too. So that kind of supported that as well. Yeah. Um, in terms of neoplastic versus inflammatory, I'm thinking more neoplastic because we kind of have this, looks like a proliferation kind of of this nodule of blue cells in the dermis, but it's so well circumscribed that I'm also favoring it's more of a benign uh, process rather good. than something that's <clears throat> infiltrating. Yeah, good. Um, it's tough to say when you just got a shave of something like this, but <laughs> And we get that all the time, you know, they may it's like a little <laughs> papule, but you can kind of say, well, let's say if we drew a, a circle around the whole thing, it probably would be about that big, you know, it's not going to be mm -hmm. giant and huge and ugly like that. So yeah, you're right. And based on what we have here, it seems like it's you kind of sort of draw a line right there and here and you draw a line down the middle of it, it looks pretty symmetrical. So if you, you can't apply all the criteria, you can sort of <laughs> do as you can. So that's good. You're exactly correct. Okay. So at least at home, when I was zooming in a little bit on the slide, what stuck out to me first was the number of kind of multinucleated giant cells um, that I saw like throughout the lesion. So that kind of um, put me in like this the, kind of the giant cell track. Um, and then I was looking at the sp specific morphology of the giant cells. So I was like, are these Teuton cells? But really, I don't see a lot of, these aren't really like two tiny giant cells um, to me. Um, and the nuclei, are, nuclei also aren't too atypical, like they're, they are more typical. And I noticed that in some of them, it looked like um, the nuclei were kind of aggregating towards like one half of the cell. Um, so that made me think more, of, I guess, uh, like the giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath look, given the location and how it appeared like well circumscribed and then with this kind of form of giant cells. What, what cells do you think these are here? So your description of those was perfectly correct. But I think, it, and, I, and you raise a very good point. So when you're dealing with a lesion that's got uh, multinucleated, so we know there's like lots of nuclei here, <laughs> giant cells, they're big. You know, here's like a probably just a histiocyte here and a lymphocyte here. So these are giant in size compared to those. Um, so how do you sort of decide which multinucleated giant cell you're dealing with? So it, it's, uh, you know, normally we don't spend a lot of time in a differential diagnosis of giant cells, but um, this is a good example of where it's probably worth taking a couple of minutes to, to do that. Yeah. Um, so from what I was reading, the it kind of depends on, I guess, how the nuclei or how the nuclei kind of aggregate within the giant cell or like the the macrophage. I guess is technically yeah, that, that's definitely is. one one way. Yeah, you look for for uh, the orientation of the nuclei with respect to one another. And here, you kind of see this almost kind of like a bag of marbles. I mean, they're just all mm -hmm. kind of, uh, all lumped in there in the cytoplasm. They're not really forming any kind of a wreath. Um, mm -hmm. anything like that. So they're just kind of a, a large cell with a lot of nuclei in there. And yes, you're right. They're totally typical. There's no uh, atypicality. And, and they do look like nuclei of a cell. They don't look like lymphocytes that are migrating into the cell. That's the other thing that you kind of have to make sure that you're not dealing with. And the other thing that you can look at too is the, is the cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's the color of the cytoplasm? Is it homogeneous? Um, is it have two different colors to it, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think like, um, cause like even in the, in the Teuton giant cells, I think the center could be a little bit more pink. And then like in the, 
um, like reticulo histiocytosis, it was more of like the ground glass pink cytoplasm, which I also didn't note here. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. exactly right. They kind of have, it does have an amphiphilic sort of pinkish color. This to mm -hmm. me was more purple. Mm -hmm. And in a Teuton giant cell, you'll often get kind of a wreath of nuclei with a central mm -hmm. area of pallor. And then you'll also get, it was, you know, it's a nice sort of mnemonic in a way is it, it does have sort of two tones to it. The <laughs> clear uh, sort of, it's not really foamy cytoplasm, it's kind of a, a pale, uh, almost fluffy, cottony cytoplasm coupled with some that's a little bit more purplish. So you're right, you don't have that here. You've got these just uh, a large cell that's just got a lot of nuclei in it. And then uh, you can get Langhans giant cells. There you get, uh, usually don't have a two, <laughs> Uh, tone cytoplasm, which you, you'll get kind of horseshoe, if you will, of, uh, of, of, the, of the nuclei in there. So that's, that's a Langhans giant cell. And those are often seen in foreign body reactions also. So those can kind of look mm -hmm. similar. Um, you can get, you know, large cells that, that have abundant foamy cytoplasm, like uh, maybe a, a cell that, in a, say, in a, uh, a lipid-laden uh, entities such as, uh, say, xanthoma, something like that. Those can get giant cells in there. You get the large cells that have a lot of cytoplasm with a relatively large centrally located nucleus and uh, Rosei Dorfman disease, and there mm -hmm. you get imperiopoiesis. So these cells here, um, what kind of cell do you think we're looking at here? So you're right. The, the answer is correct. This is a giant cell tumor, uh, mm -hmm. Keith. But what kind of cell do you think those are? And what is this material over here? I was thinking that was some sort of like fibrotic, like scar-like tissue. That's in the differential diagnosis of it because it's pink. But yeah. notice it's also got these little centrally located cells, a little sort of space around them there. Mm. And there's a little tiny area here that may actually even be some cells that are forming a blood cell in here. Mm. So this is a little focus of bone. Bone. Okay, got it. This is like osteoid okay. that's forming bone. And so when you have bone, it remodels oh. in our body. We have osteoclasts and osteoblasts, <laughs> right? So okay, these are cool. probably osteoblasts blast like giant cells or osteoblasts that are associated with the giant cell tumor. And so this is an ossifying giant mm. cell tumor of tendon sheath, which is kind of an interesting one. Okay. So uh, these are probably the osteoclasts out here, I'm going to guess. And then, then you've got probably the, the osteoblast. I, again, I'm not a bone pathologist, but it shows the uh, just an example of, an oste of a, a giant cell tumor that's undergoing ossification. So it's an interesting example, but it's a nice, it's a nice a case to show you the difference between these different kinds of giant cells. And we'll, we'll see unknowns that, that show some of those other giant cells as well uh, as we go through our sort of curriculum of, of unknowns. So anyway, this is a nice example of that. If you leave these, and, and they don't always have to have this many giant cells, they, they very often don't have bone in them. Um, <laughs> sometimes you'll just get a lot of these sort of epithelioid cells like this that don't, without all these large cells associated mm -hmm. with them. Um, if you leave these alone for many, many years, they may eventually turn into primarily a lot of fibroplasia and they're, they're in the family of the fibromatoses and uh, mm -hmm. family of fibroma of tendon sheath. So they don't always have to have the giant cells. They can sometimes just be kind of more of a fibroma of the tendon sheets. They're, they're thought to be related to the, to the tendons. Okay. So good, excellent. It's an interesting, interesting case. All right, let's take a look at this one. Okay, hi, Dr. Cockrell. This is Leah, I'm a Baylor first year. I can take this one. Okay, great. So this is, looks like um, we have a wide punch or maybe an excision. And my eye is drawn to this uh, walled off cavity in the upper dermis. Okay. Looks like it has a true epithelial lining from this magnification. Good, it does, absolutely. And um, notable things about this um, cyst-like structure, I'm seeing some hairs inside of it. I'm also seeing some inflammation around it. Good. Excellent. Now you said cyst-like structure. Um, elaborate on that phrase a touch. So 
I guess I wanted to wait until we got a little closer, but I guess I could also consider that this could be the follicular epithelium. Yeah. So what's when you say cyst like another synonym for that is cystic, <sighs> right? And so okay. what's the difference between something that's cystic and something that's a true cyst? Hmm. I think if I'm trying to get at what you're asking me, <laughs> um, I can't tell from the sectioning if this is a true cyst or if there is an orifice that I just can't see. Okay. But what, what's your definition of a true cyst in the skin? Um, something with a true epithelial lining. Yeah. 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 Good. Exactly. It's like a, it's like a balloon in a way. It's, yes. it's, it's <laughs> all round structure that's got an epithelial lining. So it's a true, and this does have an epithelial lining, mm -hmm. right? And it does yeah. look like a little balloon here. Right. So, you know, basically when we decide if something is a real cyst or not, we have to look for that. Now, what's a situation where something can be cystic and it's the cyst-like structure where it doesn't really have an epithelial lining? Um, like a mucosal? That's a good example. Yeah, mucosal. Um, but uh, like, is it any situation where you have something that forms a, a, like a space, but it's not really got a true epithelial lining around it like this? It's not really a balloon. So let's say you had like a, a solid lesion, like maybe a squamous cell carcinoma mm -hmm. that underwent necrosis on moss, mm -hmm. and then a lot of that central stuff degenerated, and it really mm -hmm. looked like a cyst, but it wasn't a cyst. So that would be oh, something yeah. you say that's a cystic area or cystic space. So that's because it's not really a true epithelial lining. So here we, we do have, this is a real cyst. It's a true cyst in a way. Um, now you can get sinus tracts. I think you kind of alluded to that also. And those are analogous to cysts because they're epithelial lined. And sometimes we see like, you know, infundibular cysts that connect to the surface and they've got a dilated follicular osteum. You see a little pore off, you know, in the clinic. So that's still in the, family of cysts, if you will. And so if we're going to, if we're going to talk about the cyst here, what kind of lining are we looking at here? It looks like a stratified squamous epithelium. It has a granular layer. Excellent. Excellent. So is this, now there are other cysts than, than hair follicle cysts, right? So yes. you think this is more likely a follicular cyst? I do. Yeah, good. And which part of the hair follicle are we looking at here? Hmm. Which part's got stratified squamous epithelium? Uh, I think it's the infundibulum. Yeah, absolutely. The infundibulum is just basically kind of an invagination from the epidermis in a way, and it's still got stratified squamous epithelium. As you go down a little further, you get into the isthmus, and that's where you get into trichalimal differentiation. You lose the grain or solar. This may just be a little area of maceration, but you know, this may be kind of an area that's becoming a little bit of a near the isthmus, if you will. And then you get the inferior portion, which is where you get the germinative epithelium, uh, the you know, the basophilic cells, you get the, the cells that are forming more of the, the primitive hair shaft, if you will. So, those are the three main parts of the follicle. So, here we're looking at the top part. Now, is there anything unusual about this cyst? compared to like a regular good old fashioned epidermoid cyst or infundibular cyst? Yes, there, uh, there is like a um, laminated keratin a little bit, but it's most of these hairs that um, I'm noticing, the vellus yeah. hairs. Good, there's several hairs in here. Now you said vellus hairs are these, these may not really even be vellus, right? They're, they've got a lot of pigment in them. They've got a medulla. So these may be guard, just regular old hair shafts that are sitting in the middle of this the cyst here. Mm. So, and you're right, it may actually be kind of a sinus in a way that forms a cyst, you know, trying to wall this off. And here you've got a hair shaft that's again, got some epithelium surrounding it, all this inflammation. Mm -hmm. on that. You, can, you can imagine this was an inflamed area here. Mm -hmm. So do you know any kind of cyst, if you will, that gives you these large, relatively mature hair shafts within them surrounded by this stratified squamous epithelium? So I was thinking um, if it were vellus hairs, then I could just maybe think about just a vellus hair cyst. But if you're saying that these probably are more mature um, terminal hairs, then I could think of uh, trichofolliculoma, um, also maybe one of those um, like doll's hair um, 
phenomena. What's tell me about the dolls here phenomena. So um, conditions like um, CCCA, where you can have multiple hairs. That's kind of where I was thinking. Okay. That usually wouldn't give you a cyst, though. But they, they did have this on my board examination years and years ago. So if they had it on my exam, they could have it on your exam also. Um, it's hard to tell the location here. You know, if I told you this was near the sacral area and it was a solitary lesion that was a little papule with maybe a little bit of inflammation surrounding it that would kind of correlate with this, would that help you at all? And this guy was maybe a pilot. He flew a lot and he was sitting around for many hours every day. Uh, maybe a pilonidal cyst? Yeah, that's exactly what this is. It's a pilonidal cyst, also known as a pilonidal sinus. And what a lot of people think really happens here primarily is they think that there's trauma that causes these hair shafts to kind of get sort of transplanted in the dermis and then the cyst really forms almost as a secondary phenomenon around it to kind of transepidermally eliminate the hair shafts and get them out of there because they kind of you know become foreign bodies and uh, a vellus hair cyst usually those are comprised of these delicate little fine non-pigmented mm. uh, hair shafts in there with a very thin lining it's very thin it's, it's lined by maybe a epithelium that's only got about two or three layers of of cells there. So it's not really like a hypersystoma, but it, it looks very delicate and thin. It's almost, and this obviously is the steatosystoma. It doesn't have any sebaceous lobules in the wall. It doesn't have the corrugated linings. That's just we got a thick, almost looks like lichen simplex chronicus like lining here. Mm -hmm. And it probably is really more like a sinus, like you said. But but I think when you look at this, a lot of that's why they get called pilotidal cyst, because it looks like a cyst. And it is a true uh, epithelial line space with hair shafts in the middle of it. So it's in the differential diagnosis of vellus hair cyst, but when you see this markedly thickened epithelium that's got the thick cornified layer and whatnot, and these are terminal hair shafts, like you said, that would favor that diagnosis. There's two settings. Obviously, the one setting is in the, in the sacral area. The other setting is, is barbers get this because they, uh, they get these hair shafts that get introduced into their skin secondarily. They're almost like splinters. And then the epithelium develops around those again to try to sort of transept and dermally eliminate that. Oh my goodness. I would never have thought of barbers. <laughs> that yeah, is it's interesting. They, they <laughs> get on occasion. Dr. Cockrell, can I ask you a question? Sure. I was kind of curious about the inflammatory infiltrate. And I know I just was looking at the cells and I was just wondering if that particular inflammatory infiltrate was helpful to you or not really helpful in helping nail this diagnosis. A little, a little bit, because basically, because this is largely got, is related to trauma, these mm -hmm. hair shafts get introduced and you get a second, it gets a foreign body reaction like you see here. And a lot mm -hmm. of this stuff is really mostly reactive to the, to trauma. So the hair, it's almost analogous in some ways to folliculitis, pseudofolliculitis barbie. Um, it's not exactly that, but it's in the same sort of category as that. Um, and uh, hydroidinitis suppurativa, um, folliculitis to Calvin's, they're all kind of considered in the same spectrum of diseases. Mm -hmm. so yeah, these almost always are associated with inflammation, primarily foreign body type uh, reaction like you see here. So it's reacting to these hair shafts that, that shouldn't be there. I see. Okay. Thank you. You don't so have much. to have it, but it's, it's very commonly present. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Who wants to give this one a go? Good morning, Dr. Cockerell. This is Usman, um, also from Baylor. So this um, looks like a punch. Um, looking at it from this power, I would favor a neoplastic process. Um, and then if we, I mean, I see kind of these basophilic ag aggregates, um, you know, these dark blue to purple cells. Uh, and I see some extravasated red blood cells deeper in the dermis as well. Yeah, that's um, probably from the biopsy, most likely. Uh, but, okay. um, so you said neoplasm. Um, do you think it's going to be, can you tell me about benign versus malignant on this? Well, I think it's, it's a little... Hard to tell, at least at least to me. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe you may. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's you're not going to be able to tell just with certainty. Um, it certainly doesn't look like it's a diffuse 
uh, involved in the entire dermis or anything like that no. as, as aggregations here. And what kind of differentiation do you think is epithelial or, or non-epithelial? Um, I think I think it's non-epithelial. Yeah, good. And any specific type of uh, differentiation? Well, I would, I mean, just looking at the cell type, I would think uh, they look lymphocytic. And so I would guess that, that would be my guess good. as to what So kind of mean. like in the hematolymphoid category. Good. Yes, sir. Excellent. So, so it's really, if it's a neoplasm, it's a neoplasm of, of lymphoid cells or hematolymphoid cells, something along those lines. Good. So did you, so let's go to higher magnification. You think it was uh, benign or malignant when we went to higher magnification? Well, I would think malignant. Um, I mean, I see, well, I see some at atypia, but not, I mean, it's not, diffusely prominent, I think, but um, what kind of cells when you went to higher magnification did you think these were? So I think these are lymphocytes. Yeah, a lot of them are, but if you look carefully, there's some cytoplasm surrounding them and a little, and again, unfortunately, it's about as high as the scanning can go, but there's also some paranuclear um, halo just right around the area. And if you look carefully at the nucleoplasm, it's kind of got that uh, slightly reticulated morphology. They talk about the uh, clocked face. Oh, okay. So, so plasma cells in there yeah, as well. Yeah, so there's a lot of plasma cells, or you could even say plasmacytoid cells. And then you've got some that are pretty large admixed with these. I, I don't really see a lot of mitotic figures, but it looks like a, a, a lesion with lymphocytes and, and a lot of plasma cells in it. Mm -hmm. and I guess looking at it, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just saying, I guess looking at it closer, um, you know, looking for things like mitotic figures or early ATP or pleomorphism. Um, I, I guess I don't see a lot of that actually looking at it here. And you don't have to a lot of times, you know, when you're dealing with some of these uh, lymphoid lesions, it's sometimes more difficult to you know, if you don't see a lot of atypia mitotic, because you have to kind of rely on other, other things, like whether there's clonality here. So in other words, if you see like a cutaneous plasma cytoma, a lot of times those cells really don't look super atypical, but they're just one, you know, kappa or one lambda. So the malignancy is, is really not because of the striking atypicality. It's just that there's a lot of cells that uh, they've taken over the, uh, you know, the body's B cell lineage, if you will. So uh, they don't have to look super atypical. And so mm -hmm. we thought this was an example of a cutaneous, probably secondary involvement with somebody that may have had an underlying plasmacytic disorder. So uh, it's an interesting pattern because it shows you this sort of dermal based B cell uh, pattern. So in other words, if you're thinking the difference between diagnosis between a T cell and a B cell lymphoid process, T cell lesions usually will give you epidermotropism, whereas the B cell like lesions spare the epidermis, so give you like a grin zone, and they give you these nodular, almost teardrop like aggregations, like we're seeing here. So if you see that pattern and it's a lymphoid process and it's pretty dense like this, you should be thinking about the possibility of a B cell lymphoma or a, you know something along those lines. So mm -hmm. you're right on target. Um, it doesn't look super anaplastic or atypical, like a diffuse large B cell lymphoma that would involve everything here in the dermis. Um, and again, it doesn't, it could be your differential diagnosis would include other B cell lymphomas, like maybe a follicle center cell lymphoma or marginal zone lymphoma, one of those. So, you know, if you thought that you're on the right track, um, it's a little bit advanced for the board. Um, they would probably if they showed you something like this, it would probably give you some additional information to help you ultimately come up with a, a diagnosis. But I think the, the most important point is, is to do what you did and just get into the different diagnostic category of a, uh, of a lesion with hematolymphoid differentiation. And then because it's kind of got these irregular aggregations that are large, you think it might be a low grade malignancy. So, uh, and that would maybe even require other studies like clonality, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any questions about this one? Um, so just, just to rehab, you were, you were mentioning um, how to somewhat at least distinguish between B and T cell lymphomas. 
Um, you said T-cell lymphomas would have epidermotropism, epidermotropism and really not have this Gren zone that we're, we're seeing over here. Would that, would that be correct? Yeah, that is correct. And that's, again, of course, everything can break the rules, but as a mm -hmm. general rule, when you think of T-cell lymphomas, think of mycosis fungoides, you know, think of psoriasis form hyperplasia with, with epidermotropism and, and that pattern. Um, you know, there obviously are uh, some uh, CD4 positive, small to medium sized lymphoproliferative disorder, which doesn't give you that same pattern. It's more of a nodular pattern. But the vast majority of those, you should be thinking in terms of, of MF and MF like pattern for T cell lymphoma. Dermal nodular aggregations like this, where there's multiple nodules for B cell lymphomas. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you, Dr. Cockrell. You're welcome. Okay. Hey, Dr. Cockrell, this is Edgar, one of the other Baylor first years. I can take this one. Okay, great. Um, so it looks like we have a shave um, here. Look at it. It's in terms of type of process. I think it's more of a neoplastic process. Good. Um, in terms of location, it's a little hard to tell, but I think on, on, the, on the far right side on one of these sections, there tends to be a little bit of solar elastosis. I'm thinking this might be some type of sun exposed area. Yeah, I think you're right. I agree with that. It's just because it's, um, it's kind of like the process has sort of destroyed everything in its wake a little bit. Yes, sir. Yeah, it seems like it's kind of uh, uh, kind of butting up against the epidermis. Um, yeah, I agree. I think it's ulcerated over here also. Yes, sir. Um, I think as we get closer, it seems like we have these. You know, uh, um, these spindle shaped cells, some of them in like a storiform type pattern, uh, very well. Um, some of them even have, might have a little bit more of a, like a foamy type cytoplasm as we get closer. So you're thinking of neoplasm and are you thinking benign or malignant? I'm thinking, uh, uh, I, I guess, from higher power looked a little bit more well circumscribed. So I was thinking it might have been a little bit like uh, low grade, but I, I think it's hard to tell in this uh, in these sections. Yeah, sometimes, you know, when you get a shave and, and you know, in the real world, that's 99.9% .9 of what we get because derms are biopsying things. They're not doing primary excisions in their offices. So uh, we get shaves of, of lesions. And so you have to use the, we talked about earlier, the, the, cardinal architectural criteria. There's one feature about this one though, even at low magnification, that ought to be kind of a red flag to you here. And any idea of what I'm sort of pointing out right here? Well, maybe this central pallor region or-, or... It, it does have this central pallor and, and these cells here have more of a pink amorphous quality with these hyperchromatic nuclei and some inflammation in there. Any idea of what's going on there? Um, you may not know. Any, any other higher year residents know what I'm trying to get you to read my mind about here? <laughs> and this is, a, if you see this, it's, a, it's like screams cancer. If you see this pattern, it's not always, but not, but in the vast majority of cases, if you see what I'm pointing out here is necrosis on moss, the cancer has outgrown its blood supply and it's undergone necrosis. So tumor necrosis factor, if you will. So when you see this, that says, uh oh, I don't care how small the lesion is. I don't care how well circumscribed it is. I don't care, you know, if there's no mitosis, etc. You start looking at that and you say, this this. I have to then talk myself out of malignancy. You have a, a, a presumption of malignancy that then you have to sort of say, well, I, I presume it's cancer and I have to sort of rebut that presumption by, by finding a lot of other things that, that prove that it is a cancer. So whenever you see that, that, that should be, a, you should say, wow, uh, this, this is cancer until proven otherwise. And the same thing is sort of true, not, not exactly true, but there is again, when you get ulceration. So just think about a cancer that's maybe growing outgrows its blood supply, kind of gets to a critical mass where it kind of starts growing rapidly, it's going to do this kind of thing. It's going to necrose, it's going to ulcerate, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's not like a melanocytic nevus that's growing slowly and gives you a dome-shaped papule and eventually turns into a fibrous papule or whatever. It's going to, it's going to be, this is not good. This means it's getting bigger with the course of time. 
So that would favor malignant. And then if you go to higher magnification, you're right. There's all these spindle shaped cells here. A lot of them do have what looks like kind of a clear staining cytoplasm. Um, so what's your differential diagnosis when you see yeah, this? So as we get closer, I think there is a little bit of, like you're saying, uh, the cells look a little bit more typical. There's hy sort of hyperchromatism, maybe some pleomorphism as well. So again, going toward that malignant. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, if you look at that cell there, look how ugly that thing is. I mean, that's that's a very bizarre, large pleomorphic cell. And then uh, you may see some others here that kind of they talk about the so-called lumps of coal mm -hmm. uh, morphology of some of these cells. So we would diagnose this as a poorly differentiated malignant spindle cell neoplasm. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of our differential, as you were asking me, Dr. Cockrell. So initially, I was thinking. Um, something uh, like an AFX, but I know I, I know that tends to be a little bit more low grade and it tends, you might see some giant cells as well. So I was wondering if this could okay. be like spindle shell melanoma. That's good. Those are the things, yeah, you, there are three things that you should think about when you see this pattern first. Now there are other things that can do it, but you know, common things occur commonly. So we want to think about the three most common things that give this in dermatology. Number one is, like you said, atypical fibrosanthoma. The second one would be like a spindle cell malignant melanoma. And what's the third most common? You think one? like spindle shaped squamous cell? Spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma. Good. Those are the three ones that you want to rule out when you see this pattern. And in the old days, before the days of immunoperoxidase, back when we used to, you know, drive cars without air conditioning, <laughs> we would look at the epidermis and say, hey, well, you know, it's contiguous to the epidermis, it's probably a squamous cell, and there's no pagetoid spread of cells in here, so it's probably not melanoma, and we would sort of just say that, and now we have markers that can give us a real answer, so we don't need to guess, so we can stain it, and uh, there's a panel of stains that we put on this, so this could be a, a good board examination question. If I were writing a board examination question, I might put this on there, and I'd say, what are the the you know, three or four type of stains that you would really want to look for here to differentiate between these three most common spindle cell neoplasms on sun damaged skin of older people uh, that we see. Uh, so I guess for like uh, AFX, you would think staining like for like Vimentin, uh, maybe like CD68. I know it's also strongly positive for like CD10. CD10 is the one that I think the board would probably these days expect you to know because that's that's the one that's at least for me has been kind of the lifesaver if you will we used to use you know pro collagen one and cd68 and spotty positivity and we used to use actin and you know, that can be positive it can also be positive melanoma sometimes and even occasionally get a barren staining of squamous cell so cd10 is a great one so if you do it if this is strongly and diffusely positive for cd10 and negative for cytokeratin and for like say SOX10 and S100 protein, that's really good, good evidence that you're dealing with an atypical fibrosanthoma. And then obviously for melanoma, you know those markers, SOX10, S100 protein, and then squamous cells gonna be positive cytokeratin. You can get some staining for CK sometimes in, in AFX, but uh, not that common. So this is AFX, beautiful example of it. And you mentioned uh, the presence of giant cells. There's actually about four or five different subtypes of atypical fibrosanthoma. There are some that can give you osteoclast-like giant cells. And you know, like we saw before in the, in the giant cell tumor, you can see large cells in AFX. You can see granular cell atypical fibrosanthoma, clear cell AFX, so that's some clear cell morphology. So basically there's several different subtypes of atypical fibrosanthoma. And it does tend to have a relatively low grade biologic behavior uh, compared to say a melanoma, but sometimes these do not read the textbooks. And I've seen these metastasize and recur repeatedly and get local regional metastasis. So they, they don't always behave um, in a benign fashion. They, they, they tend to behave a little bit better than melanoma, but they you know sometimes can, can not do so great. So just remember that as well. And then the last thing is if this is a big lesion, something that's giant, maybe greater than a centimeter or so by convention, then and go deeper, then they get called pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that term, but basically just think about it that is a giant 
atypical fibrous lymphoma, and those tend to behave a little bit more aggressively sometimes because they're bigger. And these are in the family of entities we used to refer to as malignant fibrous histiocytoma. So they're all malignant lesions of uh, fibrohistiocytic differentiation. Thank so you. good, excellent. Okay, um, so for the next, this is Michael from uh, UT Houston. Um, so for our next one, it looks like we have a shave biopsy of what looks like it's probably clinically maybe an exophytic um, tumor. Um, we're seeing uh, papillomatous uh, epidermis, um, probably acanthotic as well, uh, with connection to this underlying tumor uh, consistent of uh, mostly basaloid looking cells. Um, these cells have um, kind of papillary projections going into those uh, cystic spaces, and um, they look like the cystic spaces are kind of opening up to the uh, surface of the skin. Now, do you, of, uh, you said cystic also. Mm -hmm. Do you think these are real true cysts here that we're looking at? Um, probably not true cysts. I think more cysts. Why not? I, I guess, but okay, I guess we probably are looking at uh, cysts because we do have this uh, <laughs> bi, yeah, bi it, well, it does have a cyst component to it because it's got the uh, epithelial lining to it. Mm -hmm. So just like the other, it's not, this isn't uh, something that's necrosed and it's got these just fake spaces here. I mean, this is a real, it does have a cyst. There's, there's a cyst component to this. Now, this doesn't get called a cyst. You know, you, I'm sure you know what the diagnosis is, but it does have a, a true lining it's got a true cyst lining here. And what kind of lining is this? So it looks kind of mostly like a double layered, um, uh, like ductal epithelial lining. Yeah, well, ductal or let's look at it more carefully. So what's going on right here at the very surface? Now, it looks like maybe there's some uh, decapitation secretion. Yeah, good, good. So it's apocrine differentiation. Excellent. So this is a form of an apocrine cyst, right? At least part of it is. If this is all we had right here, we would call that maybe a variant of an apocrine hydrosisoma, right? If you mm -hmm. just had this one layer here. But we have the other areas you described here, which you said, well, how would you describe this component of it? What do these look like? Uh, so you have like islands of tumor, uh, mostly uh, uh, with these kind of basaloid cells with projections, papillary projections. Papillated, excellent. Papillated, good. So papillae or pap means nipple. So these are like just little nipple-like structures. We've got an apocrine cyst. We've got papillated component to it centrally. Um, it's contiguous with the epidermis that you noted before, quite rightly. It's got this marked verrucous acanthotic epidermis up here. It's rubbed. Okay. And uh, any idea what part of the body we're on? Um, kind of hard to tell um, just based on this. I agree. I can't, I can't tell either. Um, but it's, and what are these cells in here? Oh, uh, plasma cells. Good. Plasma cells. So we've got kind of an exoendophytic process. We don't see a lot of sebaceous lobules and things like that. So we think, let's just say this is a solitary lesion that kind of maybe looks like a little red, probably eroded, oozing, uh, probably nodule, maybe in the groin area. So what's the diagnosis? Uh, so I think this is a syringocystadenoma papilliferum. That's the other entity that looks virtually identical to this. But if it has that clinical description that I just mentioned before, in the groin, not on the scalp, solitary lesion, not like a broad yellow plaque with an area that's kind of eroded in the center of it, um, in a woman maybe, more commonly, then what's the diagnosis? Um, that'd be like hydradenoma papilliferum. Yeah, yeah, good. Hydradenoma papilliferum. Exactly. That's exactly what this is. And what that entity is, is basically a benign and exo neoplasm with apocrine differentiation that's got these apocrine cyst components that's also got this papillomatous component in the center of it, often with plasma cells, as you saw before. And uh, usually it occurs in that fashion. Now, it looks 
very, very similar to syringo cystadenoma papillifrum. So the board's not going to ask you to distinguish you know, between those two. But as you know, those most commonly occur on the scalp area. Um, they're often associated with an associated neva sebaceous. So if they showed you this and they said it came from the groin, you know, then you wouldn't, if they put syringocystinone pepular from in there, that wouldn't be the best answer. That would be the second best answer, even though it does look very, it's basically the same entity, just sort of in a different area, if you will. So if you said that you're, you're, Part, you know, 99.7% correct, but you don't want to have a, uh, a, a malicious board writer fool you by giving you a different clinical scenario. And the real answer is hidden unknown papillifrum. Notice this thing is also kind of exoendophytic. Um, usually, if you look at a syringocyst unknown papillifrum, you'll see it's kind of a broad thing. You'll see just a little papule that kind of arises in it. And it's not usually as endophytic as this, but that's, that's, that's a subtle differentiation. But if you're, you're totally correct in that, it's in that family of benign neoplasms with apocrine differentiation and notice the, the papillomatous component to it. So good. Any questions about this? The thing about adnexal tumors is they're, they're pretty simple and uh, you know, the board very well can, uh, you know, might, they like to ask things about this. So it, it could easily be, uh, you know, they can ask those things for you because they're, they're not really, can't argue with them. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no if you put syringocyst on papillifrin on it. But if, I, if you said it came from the groin, well, then you might say it's really more hid retinal papillifrin. Okay, who wants to give this one a go? Um, I can go. I'm Juliana, by the way. Um, so uh, here we have, it looks uh, well, it's definitely not a shave, um, either a punch or excision. Um, there's, got this one, there's one other technique that gets sort of um, forgotten about, but you oh. do it a lot. You're, you've already done this multiple times is my prediction. So there's one other, I'm sorry. Is it a curette? Um, that's another technique that hopefully you don't do that too frequently, especially not for you ruling out a cancer. But there's one, so let's say somebody comes in with a, what looks like an epidermoid cyst on their scalp and uh, you want to remove that. What's that technique called? Where you make a little cut over the top of it and then you take your scissors and kind of dissect around and then you press on it like Dr. Pimple Popper and it poof, pops right out. What's that technique known as? That is a great uh, question. I don't, <laughs> I've done it but I don't know the like official name for it. Well, now you, <laughs> now you will know. It's called enucleation, enucleation technique. So in other words, that's like, like when you nucleate somebody's eye, you just kind of pop it out. Well, that's what you're doing when you enucleate a little cyst from somebody's scalp. You make a decision on it. You just kind of deliver it like you're kind of delivering a baby and out it pops. And then you put a couple of stitches in and, and there you go. And when they nucleate like that, what's that usually a sign of? Um, well, it's usually a sign of, I guess, one of the type of like skin lesions that pop right out. <laughs> Good. And, it, and usually when something pops out, it's, it's almost always benign. Right. right. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's just sure. probably kind of got either a pseudo capsule around or something and it's just totally benign and it just pops right out of there. So, so whenever you see something like this, it looks like it nucleated. There's really no epidermis or skin around it. At low magnification, mm -hmm. that's like a clue. That's the whole purpose of the discussion is that it's almost always benign. So you can instantly favor benign here. Now we may go to higher magnification. We may see the most ugly mitotic figures and bizarre changes. We may change our mind, but we're gonna really have to argue dramatically that there's something here to prove that this is malignant. So probably benign. Now, epithelial mm -hmm. or non-epithelial, we'll look at this thing. Um, I don't think that from here it looks epithelial to me. Yeah, it, you're right. I agree. It, it looks, it doesn't have things that look like a classic epithelium. Um, it's kind of got some spindle cell morphology. It's got these dark staining cells. It's got some sort of clear, sort of almost pink material in there. So it's more spindle, non epithelial. Yes. Now, there's three main types of non epithelial, like we have three main types of spindle cell neoplasms we just talked about. There's three main types of spindle cell lesions that you need to know in dermatology. 
Right. So, um, I know we talked about like the epithelial things like squames and stuff, but then there's neural, Good um, neural. neural. there is like, um, like, I guess like sarcomas. Can and be what are sarcomas usually comprised of? Most? Muscle. I'm sorry. Muscle. Muscle. Well, that muscle is the third one. And then there's one. Uh, okay. Other. And then, oh, like, uh, like fibroblasts. Fibroblasts. Good. Excellent. Good. So neural muscle fibroblasts. Those are the three main. If you want to get into the more esoteric, yes, squamous cell, spindle cell, you know, spindle cell melanoma, spindle cell uh, lesions and say vascular. So there's a lot, there are others, but the three most common ones that we want to rule out are those three first. And if that doesn't seem to fit, well, then we'll move into the other ones. We need the spindle cell lymphomas, but we're going to focus on those three. And this is a benign lesion as we talked about so between among those three which would you favor here well personally um i don't see any like glycogen snacks and based on the like encapsulation and the shape of it um and some of the features we saw uh at a lower power i'm leaning more towards neural good good this is a nerve cut in cross section where you see the little vacuoles around the nuclei and whatnot. And then this is uh, where this cut in longitudinal section. Notice these cells are kind of have a, a lazy S sort of shape morphology to them. So they kind of taper, they're lazy S. They're not jagged, you know, going, you know, left and right, 90 degree angles. They're, they're kind of slowly jagged and moving through the skin like a, like a nerve, you know, they're, they're basically moving slowly, smoothly, almost like they're kind of uh, swimming along the current, if you will. Now we do have an, another finding over here that's important. And this is uh, board might very well ask something about this because they're gonna expect you to recognize what these structures are here. Mm -hmm. So this is a benign neoplasm of neural differentiation of which there are probably about, you know, maybe four or five that you need to know. You don't need to know 50. So there's not a ton. So what are the, the, the maybe two or three most common neural neoplasms that we see in dermatology? What's the most common? Uh, so there's like a neurofibroma, which is- That's the common. most common by far. You know, <laughs> way, way the most common. And what's a little bit less common one that we see? Um, there's other things, like there's like neuromas, Good, or neuromas, and then like schwannomas. That. Those are the three most common that we see. You know, there, you know, some others, you know, we get palisade encapsulated neuromas, we see Morton's mm -hmm. neuroma, all that stuff. But the three most common are going to be neuromoma or schwannoma, and then we get neurofibroma, and then we get the true neuromas that are comprised primarily of the axons as opposed to the Schwann cells. So here, what do you think we're looking at in this case? You so think I think... These, uh, these uh, look to me like they're like the varicae bodies or like, like the pile of leaves. Good. So where do you see the varicae bodies? In a schwannoma. Which type of schwannoma? There's two types. Oh, are you like, like the Antony A and the Antony B? Yes. So which of the, those two Antonies are we dealing with here? So Antony A. Yes. Good. Antony A has varicae, right? So you'll never forget. Oh. See, nice little mnemonic there. <laughs> and if you think about the varicase, if you look at them, they're basically just like these nuclei. They're kind of lining up like uh, these are the Trojans and these are the Greeks over here and they're getting ready to charge at each other. So they, they've got the little uh, acellular area between the cellular areas here. So that's basically all a varicae body is. And these are all Schwann cells here. And, and you see those in an Antony A neurolimoma or schwannoma. Now, an Antony B um, looks kind of more like this component over here. You know, you don't, we don't get varicae bodies in the Antony B types. Um, they're, they're often a little bit more mixoid. They kind of look a little bit more like a neurofibroma, but they're well circumscribed and round like this. And basically the way that these lesions form, um, the way to think about it is if you have a neurofibroma, the, if, you, if you're like a little tiny microscopic person and you walk inside of a nerve twig and you, you know, set off a bomb, it kind of explodes and all those Schwann cells and the mixoid stroma and the mast cells and all that kind of stuff just form this large little nodule. And you really don't see the, the pre-existing nerve twig anymore. It's gone. 
there may be a few axons in there, but they're so small, they're, they're exploded. So all's left is, is just the Schwann cells. Here, there's a nerve twig out at the periphery, and you get this lesion that kind of forms like a knob on a tree. So it, you'll often see the pre-existing nerve twig um, in, an, in a, a Schwannoma, but you don't see it ever in a neurofibroma, virtually ever. So in this case, we're not seeing it, but it's very common to see a little pre-existing nerve twig, and then you see this thing kind of coming off the edge of it, the side of it. So you kind of think that maybe if you were a little microscopic person and you walked between the, uh, the say, the outer Schwann sheath of the nerve twig and you threw your bomb there, it kind of blew up the, the perineurium, if you will, instead of the anything inside the nerve. So that's a way to think about that. So this is like a knob on a tree branch. The other one is like the, you go inside the tree branch and it explodes. So that's kind of how neurofibroma, it doesn't really form that way, but that's the way to think about it. So, you, and these are almost always, you know, well circles got little nodules that pop out. Clinicians never diagnose these. They, they think they're cysts or something like that. But uh, that's a nice example of an Antony A schwannoma. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Dr. Cockrell, this is Anna. I can go for this one. Okay. Um, so it looks like we have a punch. Good. Um, and then I think um, there's some muscle in this and some hair follicles. Okay. Um, so we could be um, like in the genitalia or the eyelid or maybe like the nipple. Eyelid would be a little funny for a punch biopsy like this. Sure. The eyelid skin, if you've ever seen a biopsy, it's, it's, you, it's about this thick and then you're into the fat. So it probably wouldn't be eyelid, but some, some hair bearing area, I agree with you. There's, there's a lot of smooth muscle bundles. Usually nipple would have even more than this, but it could be close to that area. It could be like near an erectile tissue. I'll, I'll go along with that. But anyway, we know we're in a hair bearing area. So we think we're inflammatory or neoplastic process. I think this is inflammatory. Good. And remember those nine patterns of inflammatory infiltrates. Uh, what, uh, which pattern do we think we're dealing with here? When I was zooming in, um, I was seeing, I feel like I see both like an interface dermatitis as well as a superficial perivascular dermatitis. Okay, good. There's a superficial perivascular infiltrate. And then the main changes we have are here. As you pointed oh, out. Vacuolar change. Now let's look carefully at that. Some of that may be, but if you look here, to me, the base basal cell layer looks pretty much intact. Mm-hmm. So, so more of like a subepidermal yeah, blister, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we've got a subepidermal blister here. So subepidermal vesicular dermatitis, and there's no necrotic keratinocytes overlying it, right? So we don't no. really have any of that. So I think we've got a subepidermal blister. Now, when we're dealing with subepidermal blisters, what's your approach there? So you can look at like the cell types, like the inflammatory Good. cells that are in. Excellent. So in this case, yes, you that's can probably see the that number one like, thing you want to look at. Cell type. Absolutely. Um, in this what, case, what was the main cell type here? Um, so inside of the blisters, I'm seeing a lot of neutrophils. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Your differential diagnosis, just it's just like if you're doing the lottery, you know, and suddenly you have four numbers, <laughs> you only have two left. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Your di differential is, is low here. So there's not a ton of diseases that give you subepidermal vesicular dermatitis with polyps. That's, that's the good news. In fact, you may, that may be the final answer here, at least at this, uh, in this biopsy, because you may need other tests to distinguish between or among those various conditions that give you that pattern, right? So what, sure, are, like what are the diseases that give you subepidermal blistering with neutrophils? So there's um, like three that I can think of. So dermatitis, um, herpetiformis, and then um, linear IgA, and then bolus Good. lupus. Good, those are the three most common by far. 
So those are the ones that you're going to want to distinguish among for sure. There's a couple of others um, that I can just I'll add to your knowledge base on that. If you get uh, epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita, there's some forms of that that can give you neutrophils rather than eosinophils and lymphocytes. Um, you can get a neutrophil rich bullous pemphigoid sometimes. It's pretty rare, but that can sometimes give you this pattern. Um, and that's, you know, 90% of those, right? Rarely PCT can give you some polys, but, you know, that's it. So you'd want to do immunofluorescence in a case like this. Um, if you're worried about bullous lupus, you know, look to the side and see if you see any other features that look like LE and you really don't have a lot of changes that look like that. There's no thinning in the base of the immune zone. There's no effacement of the epidermal lesia. So probably it'd be less likely, but I wouldn't rule that out just on the basis of this. So in this case, we said that we thought in the, in the context of the clinical information here, it might have been like a variant of pemphigoid, like cicatricial pemphigoid, but we wouldn't know that on this. So the key to this diagnosis is just doing exactly what you did, describe what's the, where's the inflammation, look to see if there's a subepidermal blister or not, and there is here, and it's a true blister, and there's neutrophils in here, and your main differential diagnosis would be those things that you mentioned before. So this is, uh, you know, this would be something the board might give you and show you this and then ask you a second order question about it. They're not going to ask you to tell the difference between those three entities, but they're probably going to, they might say this was demonstrated a positive a linear band of, uh, of IgA or, or demonstrated IgA deposits and granular pattern at the junction. What's the most likely diagnosis? Or, or this patient had an HLA B8 positivity, you know, something like that. So that's what they might do on a case like this. It's, it's you know, expect you to pick up on pretty quick that this is a sub blister with neutrophils. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We'll probably time to do this last one. You guys need to leave in five minutes or so, I believe, so. Good morning, this is Chelsea from UT. I'll do this one. Um, so we have a punch here, and I think the most striking thing looking at the punch is it's more square and rectangular rather than the tapered look of a punch we normally see. Good. Um, so that, is that a sign of? Um, I think sclerosis or... Yeah. Yeah, usually some sclerosis or some markedly thickened component of the dermis of collagen. Um, metastatic breast cancer sometimes can do that. Sclerodema okay. where you don't really get sclerosis. But yeah, the, the, that collagen is too firm. It should contract. You're right. Yeah, so just with that, that kind of starts leading me down one avenue. Um, looking at from this power, I see that there is some edema in the upper dermis. And then looking at it, I see um, some compact stratum corneum and then probably a thinned epidermis. So I see that kind of red, white, and blue pattern. And then possibly underneath that edema, I see kind of a thin band of inflammatory infiltrate. It's sparse, but it's there. Yeah, and it actually, if you kind of go deep, mm -hmm. you see some changes down here too. What kind of cells are these? Those look like lymphocytes to me. If you look carefully, you may not get in, unfortunately, we can't zoom any higher than this. You're probably going to see some plasma cells add mixed in that too. Okay. So just anytime you see this pattern, and what about this part of the dermis? Is this normal or is this abnormal? Um, I still think it's a little abnormal. I think it's yeah. too myelinized. It's totally, you're right. It's, you've got homogenization of the collagen bundles. You've got a decrease in the number of fibroblasts. You've got these lymphoplasmocytic aggregates. You've actually got some sweat glands sitting up here where they should be kind of down in the subcutaneous fat, like here. Mm -hmm. These have been replaced. So you've got sclerotic collagen both down in here, and you've got sclerotic collagen up here with edema. Mm -hmm. So what's the diagnosis? I was thinking like in sclerosis. Okay. What but about like with there? an overlap of morphia. Yeah, good. So by convention, if we see this part involved, we say it's morphia or scleroderma because it's involving the particular dermis. If we only have the papillary dermis involved, we call it lichen sclerosis. And it's pretty common, I'd say quite common, to see patients that have what looks like classic morphia, they may have that sort of whitish color on the top a little bit, and then you biopsy, and they've got features that look like LSNA at the top, 
and then have obvious morphia-like change beneath. So we call that morphia with features of lichen sclerosis. And it's a pretty common pattern, actually. So, um, so the morphia kind of trumps over the lichen sclerosis. I'm sorry? So the morphia, the evidence of morphia that you see trumps the lichen sclerosis attributes that you see. Yeah, if you see the stuff in the college, way down here in reticular dermis, you say, yeah, you know, that's not just all lichen sclerosis because it's involving the reticular dermis. So it's got lichen sclerosis at the top, for sure, but it's got the changes of morphia down here. So we don't just say, well, it's lichen sclerosis that's involving the reticular dermis. We say, no, no, they've got morphia and they've also got features of LSNA, or they might have an overlap between the two. Um, but basically, if you just treat the LSNA with maybe topical testosterone or whatever, you're not going to reach this. You know, you're going to need narrowband UVB or something like that to get down and, and treat this part of it because it's obviously a deeper process, whereas LSNA is, is confined to the papillary dermis. So um, that's just a way to think about it. It was very common to see this together. Now, just one final thing. Um, if we just had this um, and sent in to you as the dermatopathologist uh, of the day as uh, rule out scleroderma, What's your diagnosis going to be? <laughs> um, you can tell the difference between, yeah, yeah, you can't tell the difference between somebody that's got lung disease and maybe going to die versus morphia um, versus crest. You know, they all give you this in final common reaction pattern of the sclerotic collagen with lymphocytes and plasma cells. They all look the same. So if you're, if you're submitting it to a dermatopathologist to get an answer, they're not going to be able to tell you. All they're going to say is, is this is in the family of the sclerotic conditions. So they all end up looking like this, but we can't distinguish among the various entities. It really requires clinical correlation to distinguish them. So that's kind of an important point to know when you're taking a biopsy. Don't expect the dermatologist to just look and say, ah, morphia. Well, no, not ah, morphia. I mean, this could be acrosclerosis. It could be, you know, this person could be on death's door from interstitial lung disease. So you basically need to have the clinical correlation uh, coupled with that rather than just looking at pathology alone. If you saw this with it, that's less likely seen in, in systemic sclerosis, but I don't know. I'm not sure I would just totally exclude that if the clinical was, was right for it. Great, thank you. Well, great, we got through most of them. So we'll uh, go over the rest of these next time. I'll see a couple of chat questions. I don't know if you guys have any other comments, but. Anyway, I hope that was educational for you, and uh, we will do it again next month. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. you. Take care.